All right, welcome back everyone. And in this experiment, we are investigating the reaction between cobalt 2 plus and chloride anion in aqueous solution. Specifically, we're interested in the temperature dependence of the equilibrium constant. We've measured an equilibrium constant before, and the principle for measuring the equilibrium constant here is very similar to the one we've seen previously in the measurements of iron 3 and thiocyanate. The difference here is that we're only going to work with one reaction mixture and we're going to vary the temperature of the reaction mixture um, rather than changing concentrations. So I've prepared a solution containing 5.4 moles per liter of chloride anions via hydrochloric acid and 0 0.01 or 10 to the negative 2 moles per liter of cobalt 2 plus ions. And I've gone ahead and heated this to a temperature of about 70 degrees C right now, and I've set up a spectrometer to record a visible spectrum. This is just a deionized water blank. So what we're going to do now is measure the absorbance of this solution right here. Uh, in this experiment, unlike the um, experiment involving iron and thiocyanate, we're actually given the molar absorptivity of the product at a specific wavelength, and so we can measure the absorbance of this system at that wavelength to get a sense of the concentration of the product without needing to go through, for example, the Beer's Law measurements that we went through previously. So I'm going to make this measurement fairly quickly as we do not want that to cool down too much below where it starts. So here's the spectrum. I'm going to go ahead and hit the play button to stop it. And we can see that it's got an absorbance maximum that's down about maybe 390 or so, and we can go ahead and tap on that to see what the absorbance is there. And now we're going to give this, and by the way, that number is about 0.708, and the temperature has decreased a little bit. Let's call it 65 degrees Celsius. And now we're going to wait for this to cool a little bit and measure the absorbance again. And what you'll notice is that as this reaction mixture cools, it's going to change color, and naturally that's going to have an impact on the nature of the absorbance spectrum here. As this cools, the concentration of product changes relative to starting materials, and the color is going to change as a result. Just as a point of comparison, before we move forward, here's the cobalt solution by itself, and this is very similar to the color of the original solution at room temperature. So this reaction is going to shift back toward reactants as the temperature decreases. All right, and now we're down to about 44 degrees Celsius, and I'm going to again measure the absorbance spectrum here of this reaction mixture. It still looks blue. It's not quite as vibrant blue as it was at the higher temperature, but we haven't really transitioned yet to a pink color at, at this point. And so again, trying to do this as quickly as possible to maintain the temperature as best we can. We'll throw it in there, go ahead and hit play. We're going to store that first spectrum so that we can compare this one to the first one. And there it is. So this, if we, if we um, display all runs here now, we can get a sense of the difference here. And run two is actually a problematic run um, in it, uh, that, I, that I did earlier, so ignore run two. Runs three and one, you can see run three has a bit of a decreased um, absorbance in this key region, this key orange region. Um, and that huge peak in the purple region has completely disappeared. So this, I think we should actually ignore. And we should really focus on this absorbance around 697 nanometers. So now let's wait for the solution to cool a little more. And we'll take a spectrum here again in a second. And now we're down around 35 degrees C, and once more, we're going to pull up a little bit of this reaction solution and measure an absorption spectrum. Reaction mixture still looks a little bit blue, but it's definitely a lot less vibrant than um, it, it was at the higher temperatures. Can't really recognize a pink color just yet, but that's what we would expect to see of course, if the reaction mixture were all 
um, reactants since the cobalt 2 plus hexa aqua complex is most definitely pink in color. Okay, so we'll go ahead and hit play and we're going to store the last run as we did previously. And once again, if all goes according to plan, we're going to focus our attention on the region around 690 nanometers. So a pretty significant change has happened with uh, run four. We've gone from right around the 690 region, 0 0.24, uh, 0.28 to 0.24 to 0.12 now in uh, run four. And that peak in the purple region, again, has completely disappeared, which was the same as the previous run. And so we're seeing a decrease in absorbance at that 690 point, which indicates a decrease in the concentration of the product. Even if we can't see the reactants just yet, we can use this as evidence that the product is disappearing. All right, so we'll wait a little bit for this to cool close to room temperature, and we'll take yet another measurement. Okay. Now we're down at about 27 degrees C, and I can't resist taking another measurement because I noticed a definite transition in the color and, and the introduction of a slight pink hue here. So there's a little bit of pink in there, a little bit of blue, and I think we will continue to see the trend in the absorbance around 690 decreasing as the reaction shifts from the product side to the reactant side, going from that cobalt um, tetrachloro complex with four chlorines coordinated, uh, chlorides I should say, coordinated to cobalt, to the cobalt 2 plus hex aqua complex, which is the typical pink form of cobalt that you see, um, for example, when cobalt nitrate is dissolved in water. So there we go, pipetted the solution in, and we're going to again store the latest run so we have that data. And as soon as the new spectrum comes in, going to hit stop here and we can see that if we focus again on kind of the 690 ish region the absorbance there has indeed decreased as the temperature has uh, has decreased and actually just to show you the solution here it's gotten a lot more um, I would say transparent as we've cooled down and a lot less prominently blue than it was when we first started so we'll take maybe one more measurement of this um, I will supply you with sample data, of course, to complete the experiment, but this gives the, the basic gist. We can see that the absorbance is decreasing um, as the temperature decreases, indicating that the reaction is shifting to the left toward the reactant side. Okay, and we're back for one last measurement of this solution. It is definitely looking pink now. Now, it's, it's very hard to see probably on the video, but this is a very faint pink color. It, essentially, it looks like um, the diluted cobalt solution that we started with. So the temperature now, by the way, is about 19 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to grab one last cuvette, make sure it's nice and clean, and pull up a little bit of this solution to take one last absorbent spectrum. So, And again, the trend we've noticed here is that the absorbance at 690, which is indicative of the product, has decreased as the temperature has decreased, suggesting that the reaction shifts to the left. Um, one thing you're going to be asked to think about in the data workup for this uh, experiment is, um, well, you'll be, you'll be asked to calculate delta H and delta S under standard conditions for the reaction based on these results. This is actually all you need to do that, thanks to the definition of, of delta G and the relationship between the equilibrium constant and, and delta G. This data we're collecting is all you need to measure delta H and delta S, and then um, explain why delta H and delta S have the signs that they do based on the nature of the reaction itself. Okay, so here's our last measurement, and we can see that last line just kind of crept in on the bottom here. If that's difficult to see, this run is this line at the very bottom where we can see very low absorbance in that 690 region. I'll we'll go ahead and stop it so that we can get a sense of the numbers around 690. Um, the run we just did, whoops, sorry, the run we just did, 0.057, which is even smaller than the 0.084 that we had in the last run. So there's a definite trend here of decreasing absorbance at 690 nanometers as the temperature decreases. 
And as I was saying, from this data, we can calculate, of course, an equilibrium constant for the reaction. This is conceptually very similar to what we've done previously with iron 3 and thiocyanate. And then what we're going to do is use the K values as a function of temperature to calculate delta H and delta S. And this can be done by combining the definition of delta G as delta H minus T delta S and the relationship between delta G and K, delta G under standard conditions, is negative R, the ideal gas constant, times temperature, times the natural log of K. Using these, we can calculate delta H and delta S to gain some insight into how the reaction works thermodynamically. And then these values will make sense of the signs of these values by looking at the chemical equation and exploring, for example, why delta H is positive or negative, or why delta S is likely to be positive or negative.